Okay, uh, we, we had some delay for lunch, but I hope you are enjoying or you have been enjoying the lunch. And now we are starting a keynote speech, lunchtime keynote speech. So it's uh, a little bit delayed, but uh, we, are, we are doing fine. So uh, our keynote speaker is Ambassador Mike Armacost, and I will uh, invite um, uh, Ambassador Sasae to the podium to introduce our keynote speaker. Well, I, I hope that you had a good chunk of uh, food uh, uh, for the relaxations. And uh, Ambassador Michael Amakost, uh, we all know him. Uh, he's a distinguished fellow at the uh, <coughs> Walter Scholestein Asia Pacific Research uh, Center and uh, Stanford University. And uh, he, um, he was ambassador uh, uh, to Japan and uh, Philippines. And um, he had uh, distinguished uh, policy makers and diplomats. And uh, when I was a uh, young diplomat in Tokyo, uh, he was standing high as a uh, well-respected ambassador and uh, one day uh, I thought at the time I want to I want to be a like man like him you know uh, a kind of uh, icon figure or a role model of the thought uh, and uh, in later years uh, I became ambassador to Washington and uh, there are several ambassadors I was always having mind both American and Japanese. Ambassador Amakost was one of those uh, which I hoped uh, to be following through. And um, <coughs> yeah, when I, I um, you, you know all his great achievement, you know, he was uh, <coughs> not only ambassador and assistant secretary uh, for the State Department, and uh, he had done many work, and uh, and he was given many awards. Uh, so I don't get into all this detail. I just simply want to thank him and to agreeing to have this uh, symposium. Uh, when I sent an uh, email to him, I want to have this uh, symposium with Stanford, and he was kind enough to look into the possibility. And so uh, uh, once again, um, I'd like to. Uh, Thank him and welcome uh, for, for his speech. Ambassador Amakos, please. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to see uh, so many familiar faces. I'm coming from outside of Stanford, and particularly to be introduced by such an old friend and colleague. I don't know what's wrong with us, but it seems to be moving. Uh, I, I can hold on to it, but if there's a... <laughs> How long will it stay there? <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel this is a great opportunity to return to a subject that has preoccupied me for quite a number of years. Uh, got involved with uh, Japan almost by chance. Uh, I was teaching down at Pomona College back in the 1960s, and I had a sabbatical leave coming up. I had never had a sabbatical leave. So the question was, where shall I go? And where would the family find it interesting to go? I'd never been in Asia. The thought hadn't really occurred to me, but uh, at, at the time when the uh, pressure was rather intense to decide in order to find a place, Dean Kyoko Cho of International Christian University in Tokyo happened to visit Claremont. And someone asked me if I would uh, pick her up at the airport and drive her out to the college and get her back to the, to the airport. And so in the course of uh, doing my duty, 
as chauffeur, uh, I learned a lot about ICU. And it sounded quite intriguing because they allowed some courses to be taught in English. So I said to her, do you suppose there would be any interest in a person that could teach about international relations and U.S. foreign policy, but only in English? And she said, uh, I'll inquire and get a note back to you when I return. And when the note came back, it had a contract in it to, to teach the next year. So that was the curious way in which, more than 50 years ago, I made my first uh, visit to Tokyo. <coughs> and when I arrived, I think a lot of people, upon meeting an American in those days, assumed you were some kind of Japan expert. And of course, I wasn't. Uh, I hadn't been in the country before. I had never made speeches about it. I didn't know much except that the uh, year offered me an opportunity to learn as much as I could about a country which in 1968 was beginning to loom uh, pretty large on the international landscape and uh, there weren't very many people teaching about it. So I figured uh, I would spend the year learning as much as I could and it turned out to be a year that uh, opened the door to a real adjustment in my career, and it was a great adventure for my family. I didn't actually teach very much at the ICU because students there, like students, uh, I guess, everywhere in 1968, 69, enjoyed uh, striking <laughs> on campus <laughs> rather than attending classes. And the strike occurred rather early in my tenure, and it didn't uh, end before I left. So it gave me quite a lot of time to learn as much as I could about uh, Japan, particularly about its government, its foreign policy, interactions with the United States. And uh, when I came back during the course of that year, uh, one of my old professor friends at Pomona had put me in for a White House fellowship, about which I knew virtually nothing. And I wound up uh, having to make two long trips to be interviewed for this fellowship. And I suspect I got one because I traveled the longest distance for the interview. And that was, I was assigned when I came back to the Secretary of State, who at that time was Bill Rogers. And Bill was a wonderful guy, but he wasn't uh, at the center of American foreign policy, most of which was being formulated and a lot of it executed from the White House in the National Security Council staff where Henry Kissinger was holding forth. So I took this job with some chagrin, but I quickly kind of drifted down the hall on the seventh floor to Elliot Richardson's office. Elliot was the deputy. He was very smart. I've forgotten whether he was governor or, vice or lieutenant governor of Massachusetts. Very good political instincts, very smart about foreign policy, and was about the only guy in state to, who was deeply involved and trusted in the interagency process. So I had a pretty good year because I just returned from Japan before taking on the assignment. Everybody kind of assumed I was a Japan expert and I still wasn't, but I went to work on US-Japan issues and the, pretty much the full range of them. And I got to, to know a huge number of people who spoke Japanese better, who knew a lot more about to Japan, about Asia, about political military affairs than I did. And the year provided me with, I think, probably the most intense learning experience I've ever had in my life, and I've benefited from that uh, ever since. At the end of the year, I was asked whether I would stay on for another year, and I readily agreed. And a one-year fellowship turned into 24 years of government service, most of which was spent dealing in one way or another with Asian issues. I served twice in the embassy in Tokyo. I uh, kept up interest uh, in Japan and Asia when I left to go to the Brookings Institution and then kept a hand in to the extent you can on the Stanford campus, though it's thousands of miles away from Washington and Tokyo. By the time I first visited Japan in 1969, the security relationship was in a rather primitive uh, state. 
we were formal allies, of course, but the alliance itself was not very operational. We extended a strategic guarantee to Japan. Japan allowed us rather flexible access to bases on its territory. If Japan were threatened, it was rather presumed that we would take care of it. If we sought compensation, it would normally come in the form of additional financial support for U.S. Uh, troops stationed in Japan. It was a pretty simple Cold War deal. Our security relations were quite an arm's length relationship. There was no joint command. There was no integration of forces. There were no shared bases. There was no joint planning. Security consultations were rather rare, and they were quite spare. Still, the alliance was uh, useful, highly useful to both parties. We had recruited a Cold War ally. We had deflected Tokyo from an alternative policy option of neutrality in the East-West contest. We had added Japan's industrial strength and its military power uh, to our containment strategy pursued in Asia and elsewhere. For Japan, the alliance was the price paid for the recovery of its sovereignty, and by contracting out key elements of its foreign policy, security policy, it was able uh, to focus much of its attention and its uh, resources on the reconstruction and development of its economy. So it was a, a deal, obviously, that uh, had huge benefits for both parties, but the operational content was lean. We talked a lot about mutuality and converging interests, but it's useful to remember that when Japan signed the alliance with the U.S., there were still 275,000 American troops stationed on 300 bases in Japan, so the U.S. was not without leverage, and some Japanese were not without resentment uh, to a treaty which had some kind of occupation feel to it. The deal was marked by two basic asymmetries and by a rather arm's length relation between our uniform military forces. We were obliged to come to Japan's defense while Japan assumed no corresponding obligation to come to ours. On the other hand, the alliance conferred on the U.S. the freedom to use bases on Japanese territory to pursue policies toward other parts of Asia with which the Japanese government might not concur, and sometimes didn't. Uh, when I went over, Vietnam was a huge issue and an issue on which uh, relatively few Japanese were sympathetic with the U.S. war effort. As for the links between our uniformed military services, joint planning was, was uh, just uh, at its start, rather primitive. Joint exercises were rare. <coughs> Intelligence exchanges were thin. Cooperation between our respective navies was most advanced, but its extent was carefully revealed. And I didn't even learn about it until I was Deputy Secretary of Defense, or Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia, when some Japanese, who apparently didn't know how secret it was, <laughs> took me down there and I found U.S. and the Japanese naval officers working in tandem as they would in their own uh, national defense establishment. Uh, during the following decade, the alliance began to be transformed into a much more operational security partnership. But I recall in 1980, Prime Minister Suzuki came to Washington, and he agreed to a communique issued after his visit that used the term DOME, which uh, formerly meant alliance. And he <laughs> took huge heat back in Tokyo for using words which accurately described the arrangement that we'd been in uh, for quite some time. Yet within a little more than a year, Japan had agreed to changes in the roles and missions within the alliance that uh, involved its patrolling of naval craft out to a thousand miles south of Tokyo for surveillance and uh, reconnaissance purposes in collaboration with American Navy ships. I think uh, then within uh, a few years, joint planning had become quite routine. Uh, joint exercises were on the schedule regularly. Intelligence exchanges were quite uh, substantial. Consultations were more frequent, and they were quite candid. I think two changes accounted for this. One was our defeat in Vietnam, 
which gave uh, the Japanese an urgent stake in dissuading us from retreating more broadly from security responsibilities in Asia. And secondly, uh, <coughs> Japan was exposed about that time to many more intrusive excursions by Russian planes and ships into its territorial waters and airspace. And therefore, that provided an additional reason for them to want us to stick around for a while. The features I've described were accompanied at the time by a set of self-imposed Japanese limitations known by some as the seven no's. And these describe the things that Japan wouldn't or couldn't do rather than things it was eager to do in a defense arrangement. No security responsibilities outside Japan. No deployment of self-defense forces beyond its borders. No military spending beyond 1% of GDP. The acquisition of no offensive military equipment. No exports of military items. No military uses of outer space. No participation in UN peacekeeping operations. No production, possession, or introduction of nuclear weapons. So these are the affirmations of what uh, remains outside of Japan's regular alliance capabilities. There were fewer affirmations of the things it could do. And you can see how this plays on a security relationship among the politicians back home. So there were always skeptics and there were always people who were eager to see us ask Japan to do more. During the late 70s and 80s, I served uh, a number of positions in the Pentagon State Department. And the transformation of the alliance, which I had observed and encouraged, was spurred by several major developments. I mentioned America's defeat in Vietnam and the Soviet Union's increased assertiveness in Northeast Asia. There was a third, however, uh, the normalization of U.S. relations with China, which prompted many Japanese to wonder whether um, American cultivation of relations with Beijing might diminish our sensitivity to Japan's own defense requirements. We naturally sought to mitigate those anxieties, but they were always part of the security landscape. I returned to Tokyo in 1989, served for four years as ambassador. Early on, the alliance was tested by the first Gulf War, and it was a time of great uh, frustration uh, for me. It was clear that Japan would not send combat troops uh, to the Middle East, and we never requested that they do so. But we did feel the alliance would suffer in the event Japan had no presence on the ground, so we looked for non-combat uh, activities, logistics support, this dispatch of medical units, uh, uh, handling of refugees, which were expected but didn't materialize. We found many officials in both the uh, Gaimu Show and the Defense Agency who were eager to work to find uh, things of that sort which the Japanese could take on. But in the end, there was neither the legal framework nor a political census, a consensus that would support those activities. And the result was that uh, we, we leaned on the Japanese for financial support. They provided $13 billion, which was the largest contribution of any country uh, outside the Persian Gulf. So it was an extremely helpful contribution, but one that didn't really play well politically. And there weren't Japanese boots on the ground, and there were many at home who criticized the uh, Japanese for not being present in that way. I retired from the Foreign Service in 93, shortly thereafter, after the Gulf War. But I continued to follow the evolution of the alliance uh, from a longer distance uh, while serving at Brookings and serving here at Stanford for the last uh, 20 years or so. I've especially admired the leadership supplied by Prime Ministers Koizumi and Prime Minister Abe in modifying self-imposed limits on Japan's defense policy and further broadening and strengthening Japan's commitment and contributions to the alliance. Mr. Koizumi <coughs> was very impress impression impressive, I thought, in fashioning steps that had been contemplated at the time of the first Gulf War and getting them authorized by the Diet during the second Gulf War. This was important because it permitted Japan to send its own ships to the ocean, Indian Ocean, uh, 
and supply fuel not only to Americans but to 10 other allies who were involved in the Afghan war. It was an important uh, contribution from a practical and military standpoint, but it also transformed the, the alliance into one that was global and was much more operational. And that is a big step, I think, uh, of transformation. Since Prime Minister Abe took office for the second time in 2012, I've also admired his timely and consistent efforts to adjust Japan's security to the needs of the time. The rise of China, North Korea's nuclear program, President Trump's, the uncertainty about President Trump's Asia policy, they all, all have served to enlarge the uh, security role of Japan in the region. Mr. Abe has responded in ways that increased Japan's power and its influence and also contribute to the cohesion of our alliance. His contributions are many. He has conducted theft diplomacy with virtually every country in the region. He's consistently increased Japan's defense budget, but not by so much that it provokes a big uh, stir at home. He has assured greater coordination of external policy through the establishment of a National Security Council in Tokyo. He has reinterpreted the Constitution to permit Japanese self-defense units to participate in joint activities with American troops outside Japan's territory. He has tightened Japan's secrecy laws to avoid leaks and to facilitate deeper cooperation with our military. He has collaborated with Americans to refine the bilateral defense cooperation guidelines. He's re redeployed Japanese units that have long been deployed principally in the north with a Russian threat in mind to the south to provide greater protection for the southwest islands that have become so contentious in recent years by the Chinese. He has modified past restrictions on the export of military equipment. He's cultivated uh, security cooperation with virtually every country in Southeast Asia. And he's attempted to mitigate the maritime confrontation with China over the Senkaku Islands by setting up crisis avoidance and crisis management mechanisms. It's a long, impressive list. Of course, Mr. Abe has been in office since 2012, and that's the longest tenure, I think, of a Japanese prime minister, perhaps ever. And he had, this is his second term. China often characterizes Abe's policy as a revival of Japanese militarism. That's a laughable assertion. Japanese institutions that are designed to assure civilian control of the military are very robust, far more so than China's. And while the Japanese defense budget has steadily increased in recent years, the increase has been extremely modest uh, at a time when the Chinese have increased their military spending by 300% over the last decade. So they're not really qualified to make such assertions. We're currently adapting alliance activities to the domains of space, cyberspace, the Megatron. Both countries, I think, have now imposed or embraced a whole-of-government approach to coordination on defense and security policy. Uh, what remains, I suppose, is to expand the resources and refine the habits required to maximize the benefits of that kind of collaboration. I believe that one of the most promising collaborative endeavors <coughs> is beginning to take shape in the larger Asia-Pacific region. Uh, it is security cooperation that is called uh, the Quad, that is, embraces the U.S. and Japan, but also Australia and India. It is thus bringing together four great democracies, uh, which have impressive naval capabilities, among other things. This cooperation capitalizes on the confluence of two seas, the Pacific and the Indian uh, Oceans, as a single strategic theater. It builds on the converging interests they share freedom of navigation and overflight, respect for international law and maritime security, dealing with terrorism in an effective way, arresting nuclear proliferation, particularly North Korea. So the hosts of converging interests around which practical cooperation can be uh, facilitated is pretty long. There have been joint uh, 
diplomatic efforts to promote our shared interests and pursue shared values, and to develop at least a potential counterweight to China's uh, power and its assertiveness. For the moment, the focal point for our uh, practical uh, activities are joint political consultations. But if Beijing's assertiveness takes coercive form, it clearly offers the basis for a wider geopolitical security arrangement in Eurasia. If it does not, perhaps there will be an opportunity to test the possibilities of collective security, but I'm not very, very confident myself that the Chinese are eager to participate in that. What further tasks might an Asian security mechanism like the Quad take on? Well, it can help build South uh, East Asia's capacity in maritime security. It could represent a counterpoint to China's Belt and Road Initiative, even if it's relatively passive. It can provide closer coordination of development assistance in South Asia and elsewhere. And it can put political consultations among us on a more regular basis. The Chinese often characterize activities like this as an effort at containment. Such fears, I think, uh, caused the Quad's demise once before, and it's difficult to anticipate what uh, precise response President Trump himself might take toward this initiative as it gathers weight and speed. So the larger question, it seems to me, may be whether Japan is prepared to take the lead. It seems to me the kind of venture that Prime Minister Abe has not only in many ways initiated, but would find especially attractive for Japan to supply a leadership role. In that respect, I suppose the key question is who could sustain it beyond Mr. Abe's tenure in office? And with that, I will stop and uh, welcome any questions you have. <laughs> Satisfying to us. <laughs> I doubt that's the reason. But the, the microphone. Yeah, hi, is uh, Larry bad. Greenwood, uh, Japan Society of Northern California. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, just a quick, just a quick question about one thing you said at the very end <laughs> about uh, Japan, U.S. Uh, uh, or the Quad providing a um, an alternative to BRI, if even on a passive basis. And I was wondering what you meant by passive and what what. Could you talk well, a little bit more about the, that? At the moment, it hasn't gone beyond political consultations, and <laughs> consultations strike me as relatively passive. So I, I suppose there have been a few military exercises in which all four Quad members have participated, but probably not just the four. That would be one area where you'd get into military activity, but it would be non-threatening defensive style of activity. And uh, I would expect to see some of this. But remember, the, the Quad was formed years ago, and it failed because of the, the uh, abandonment of it by one of its members, mostly because of domestic political problems in Australia. But I think this time it'll make people more cautious about being too assertive too quickly. And that seems to me a prudent approach so long as the security environment in the area isn't particularly ominous or threatening. Yeah. Carl Eikenberry, U.S. Asia Security Initiative. Thanks for a great talk, Mike. Um, Mike, when you talked about the uh, the Quad, then you think through those uh, those four nations, and there's a pretty good alignment of political values. Um, their way that they see economic exchange should be conducted, and broadly security interests. But we haven't mentioned a fifth major actor in East Asia, Korea. And I know over the course of your uh, long diplomatic career and and later that you've been at the center of uh, the United States, Korea, Japan, where many times the United States finds ourselves as a, a so-called umpire in the disputes between the two, and it became, I think, extraordinarily frustrating when you look at Korean political values, when you look at their theories of economic exchange, when you look at their security interests, the alignment should be there, but um, it, 
frustratingly is often not. And can you comment on your own views mm. about managing those relations? Yeah. Well, I think uh, we basically established the relationship through a very uh, active mediating role in 1965. So the relationship uh, wouldn't have existed probably without our interest in uh, not only a more substantial relationship with South Korea, but a new relationship between Japan and South Korea, which was very difficult to manage. And I wouldn't say the, the uh, environment is that great at the moment. That is, there are reservations on both sides about it. <coughs> it's domestically difficult to manage because of the attitudes of both Japanese and, and Koreans about the other. But uh, that means that uh, there is always a danger of deteriorating relations if the U.S. Uh, takes a takes a passive role. So this is a, a uh, set of relations on which we have to be active. We can't do it in public, it seems to me, because of the offense uh, taken by people in both countries. But it's a, it's a time-consuming and important diplomatic job that is almost constant. And uh, it has been a, a year, I think, in which our role has been particularly important. And uh, this is one of those reasons why you, or I at least, worry about uh, an administration under a person who doesn't attach much importance to personnel. Uh, we're almost three years into a relation, uh, an administration, and there's still unfilled jobs. Many of the top jobs, including the ambassadorship in Korea, went empty for a very long time. Uh, you only discover how, how difficult it is to manage relations when you, when you run into a crisis and you don't have the people you need on the spot. People can't come in from Washington and manage these things because there's just there's so much detail and so much depends upon the ongoing relationships our representatives have with the key authoritative members of other governments. So I think the, the combination of a very complex set of issues and the length of time we went getting started without the experienced hands that knew the country well and had the contacts that could produce results has been partially the reason why we've experienced trouble. I hope we've got the right people now, <laughs> but it's taken too long. And I think we all should worry about the fact that uh, any administration, no matter how determined they are and how skillful they are and how uh, many good people they've got within their ranks, takes an extraordinarily long time to get anybody confirmed. So we're, we're paying the price for, I think, the inattention or the inexperience of the current administration, but it's a larger systemic problem that confronts every new administration as a result the lengthy process confirmation has become. Just throw it to her. <laughs> uh, thank you, Professor Amarcos, Vanessa Malter. I'm a first year master's student here at FSI. Um, and I wanted to go back on the question on which you ended, um, which was, is Japan willing to take on um, responsibility or leadership role? And I was wondering what your take on this is and what kind of factors might influence this willingness. And then I had a second question about the quad that you mentioned. Um, and I was wondering if you think the Quad would be the best way to counter China in um, the region, and if there's maybe other ways that would be more effective or more um, realistic even um, to being, well, to countering China in the region. Thank yeah. you. Uh, well, I think uh, Mr. Abe himself is responsible largely for the very impressive role that Japan has been recently playing. We, of course, helped create the conditions for that in the sense that uh, we didn't seem to supply <laughs> the kind of inspired leadership which uh, we should have and many Asians had gotten accustomed to. I suppose inevitably, as, as Asia grows, then our role will be uh, declining to some degree and quite naturally. And Japan has uh, acquired a taste for taking on tough international responsibilities, 
to which we all should be grateful. It is a, it is the alliance itself is a wonderful asset for us, and alliances in general are the means by which we expand our influence in, in a huge uh, number of ways. So we need to, to be attentive to the requirements for alliance management. I don't, uh, I don't know that I could mention another person who has Abe's qualifications right now, but it seems to me there is an experiential aspect to this that is the Japanese, I think, are quite content to see their leader play a larger uh, Asian role. And I think other leaders in the region are taking a look at that and admiring it and imagining that their own leaders could uh, play a comparable role. Not many have the weight behind them to do so, but there are a few. And so I think it's a, it's a healthy time for Asians to be presenting uh, themselves in leadership roles on security matters. And I hope our, our representatives are encouraging that at a moment when we, we have fallen a bit on hard times. What was the second question? <laughs> oh, the quad. Uh, quad was tried once before. It uh, didn't flourish. People weren't ready for it. It'll have to be a careful and slow process because the countries are quite different. They face different security problems. They all have their own domestic uh, constituencies, not all of whom are very enthusiastic about this. I don't think it's going to take on many practical roles right up front, but starting with political consultations as they become more fruitful, more candid, and more regular, that is a big asset in and of itself because it assures that when we take actions in Asia, we are better informed about them and have a better calculation about the extent to which other key countries would, would play cooperative roles. So I think it's uh, interesting that it's gotten off the ground now well, twice. I'm hopeful that the second try will be more successful, and I suspect it will be, but a lot will depend on the kind of issues it has to face. If all, if all four are threatened by the same uh, uh, phenomenon, then cooperation gets a lot easier. And when China's role is as uncertain as it is, but when it uh, has on occasion been coercive, as on the South China Sea Islands, then that evokes a strong common reaction. And it's at that point when people in government begin to think of cooperative ways of doing practical things to respond to or mitigate the threat. So I think it's, its future will depend a lot on the, the issues that arise in the area, uh, the quality of the leadership in each of those countries, and to some degree on the, the encouragement they get from us. I mean, if we chose to try and uh, complicate the emergence of a, another regional grouping like this, we, we could probably do that without too much difficulty. But uh, sustaining a position of support uh, for what is not going to be a rival, I think, but would be a complement to U.S. efforts in Asia, uh, that, that takes a lot of effort. And it will depend a lot over the next few years on what happens in our election. Yeah. Uh, Deepak Bangalore. Uh, when uh, around uh, the year 2000, a lot of Indo-American businessmen rushed to India to start things over there. And we found them, even, even for us, uh, so unreliable that uh, everybody pretty much got out by 2010. And we don't think Indians are a reliable partner for American-style activities. What is your opinion on the squad and, and where India stands and uh, how reliable do you think they are from a geopolitical sense? Yeah, well, I'm not the best guy to ask because I, the State Department has always been organized in regional groups in which India doesn't fit into the Asian portion, <laughs> <laughs> which was odd. Uh, so I've, I've bereft of experience. I've known a lot of Indians, but they're social relationships rather than professional. Uh, I think the Indians uh, clearly are eager for a larger role. The question as to whether or not the, the complementarity between their vision of the role and that of the others uh, can be worked out is one you'd have to bet on it involves a lot of guesswork. There's not yet much to go on, but I think it's a worthy endeavor. Uh, 
and it seems to me it's worthy of a lot of time and attention by our leading diplomats, and it's probably worthy of having someone in the State Department try and find ways of increasing the coordination between East Asia Bureau people and South Asia people. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's always a, a huge economic component in our relationship with every Asian country. And it seems to me we need people who at, at the top who understand that connection and understanding can provide guidance for the negotiators. I think Mr. Trump regards himself as a quite superior negotiator, but in my view hasn't provided much evidence of that uh, at this point. I believe uh, that in dealing with Japan, uh, China, Southeast Asian countries, those negotiations are likely to be mostly bilateral. Uh, at this point, partly because the president is prejudiced against multilateral negotiations, so he's not going to put much effort in them. But I think uh, it's easier to align interests with countries with, with whom you have a huge trade, because you're always trying to find assets in the relationship. And we, we benefit from an open market, as our own open market, because we like to buy stuff as cheap as possible, <laughs> as many sources as possible. And so uh, we're not fearful of open trade, but a lot of countries are. So I, I kind of hope the next administration will come with a more positive attitude toward uh, open trade, whether multilateral or bilateral. I don't think you can do without both. And uh, the experience, the, the curve of learning uh, should produce some effective results over three years, almost three years experience now in the uh, Trump administration. They've had people operating, learning the trade. So it seems to me we ought to be able to harvest some benefits from the experiences, whether good or bad, that they've had in the last couple of years. And I hope that will be the case. Uh, then the question will be whether or not the election turns into a new team effort or whether these guys can capitalize on whatever experience they've, they've had. Uh, my name is John Shea. Just had a very simple question regards the uh, Japan's uh, uh, collective self uh, uh, defense. Would that in just limited to the Asian area, such as the uh, Taiwan Strait or South A South China Sea, or global? Thank you. Well, it, for a long time, it was uh, limited really to Japanese territory and the territorial waters offshore. Uh, but I think uh, the reinterpretation of the Constitution would permit Japan's activities elsewhere. It would be particularly important, I think, whether they were doing so jointly with the U.S., and it seems to me would be doing so jointly with the consent of the parties to the conflict. So it seems to me it's still a, a limited kind of defense force when it comes to overseas ventures, but the latitude for their operations has expanded slightly, and it seems to me the direction they're moving, that will continue. 
but it still is limited. And I think above all, uh, those kind of ventures require diet support. And the diet, uh, you can't just assume it's going to be supportive. You, they have to have a strong case they can make that Japanese security is affected. affected. And in fact, in their interpretation of the new laws that would permit them to operate somewhat more broadly outside the territory of the country, they are limited by the, the consideration of whether or not the intervention is involved with countries that are, are critical to Japan's survival. So it means long distance uh, operations, I think, are not in the cards for a while. Uh, the relationship between the country and Japan is the critical item because it means there's a visible link between their military activity outside the country and their security at home. So there, there are not a lot of issues on which I would expect them to be very venturesome now. But the movement's in a direction I think that's advantageous for the U.S. because I can't foresee any situation in which Japan would operate outside its own territory on an issue in which we didn't see eye to eye, which our security interests weren't aligned pretty well. Thank you, very much. Thank you for your attention. So our afternoon session will start at 1.15. So uh, if you, you, you still have uh, 15 minutes to walk around, uh, enjoy the sunshine if you want.